When you can hear the voice of God, you have what I call the great advantage. And the reason I call it the great advantage is because if you know me or you've heard me teach for any number of times, you'll know that I'm very, I'm very curious as to what the history of the church looked like. So I would study earlier in my preteen years and in my teen years, I would read books about great evangelists, great revivalists, great missionaries. I would read of the early church fathers, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, the efforts of the early church, the results of what happened in the book of Acts. And I would look and I would read many biographies of men and women of God who were very anointed by the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I noticed about men and women of God who were anointed by the Holy Spirit is that they always seem to be in the right place at the right time, under the right circumstances, with the right people. It's as if they knew what was coming. And you look back in hindsight, obviously, as the cliche goes, hindsight is twenty twenty. but you look back at your life sometimes, and you look at the times that you obeyed the voice of God, you look at the times where God was clearly directing you, and you didn't really understand it in the moment, but when you look back now at what God had spoken, or how God instructed you, or how God redirected you, looking back on it, it's very exciting and thrilling and easy to see that God was at work. And you say, I can see the hand of God. It's obvious now. But when you're in it, it's not the same. When you're in the situation where God is speaking to you and he's made something clear, you look at the circumstance and often we kind of go, Lord, are you sure you know what you're doing? And that's human nature to question the sovereignty of God. And then there are other times when you can look back at your life, and this is regrettable for some of us where you look back, but we all have moments like this and you say, I should have obeyed God. I knew that was the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps you look back at a situation only to realize that it was in fact the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Because often we get stuck in the moment. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of chaos. And in that moment, we look at where we are and we can't really tell that it's the Holy Spirit speaking. We get this gut feeling or this, this, this slight idea that kind of comes in very subtly. And looking back after we've ignored that, we go, that was the Holy Spirit. I should have listened. But I want to talk to you today, and I'm going to give you three very practical keys. We know that it's important to hear God, and this is what I call the great advantage. I'm going to give you three keys to hearing the voice of God. Because as I'm saying, with these people, it's like they were perfectly positioned. Can you imagine this? That God, the one who created you, the one who formed the world, the one who has all understanding, all wisdom, and foreknowledge of what the future holds, that He is able to speak to you on a daily basis, specifically in detail, straight to your heart and to your mind, to your spirit. And God wants to instruct you in this moment now, in this season of your life. You may feel like the heavens are brass. You may feel like you can't clearly hear God. You may feel like there's so much going on around you that you can't quite tune in to hear what God is saying to you. I have good news for you. That's what this message is about today. And you can become someone who has this great advantage. Once you learn the voice of God, it does away with lack. It does away with regret. It does away with calamity. It does away with chaos. It does away with wasted time because often we do things, even as the scripture says that Satan led King David to take a census of the people of Israel, and it was a waste of time. And then we see where, where King David also goes and he wants to build the temple. And the prophet Samuel gives him the go-ahead. And King David goes thinking that he's going to build the temple. Then the prophet goes, actually, the Lord spoke to me more clearly now. And in fact, you're not the one to build the temple. When you hear the voice of God, when you know the voice of God, it saves you from wasting time. It saves you from unnecessary heartache. It saves you from wasting resources. It saves you from going down wrong paths. It saves you from making ungodly connections. You know, the people with whom we're connected, that's important. But just as important as who we're connected to are those who God disconnects us from. So what God takes is just as important as what God gives. And God wants to give you this very clear, very specific instruction if only you'll be willing to listen, if only you're willing to hear. Now really, when it comes down to it, everything that God will speak, and, and you know, you talk about dreams, you talk about circumstances, you talk about coincidences, you talk about other people. God can speak through many different means, but His message is always truth. God will speak through children. As I said, God will speak through dreams. And then I can go on listing the many different ways in which God speaks. And, and you probably have experienced God speaking in unique ways to your heart. But the truth of the matter is that no matter what you hear, no matter what is spoken, no matter the, the delivery method, there are categorically speaking only three voices that speak to your heart. So no matter what the delivery system is of the message, 
categorically speaking, there are only three voices that will speak to your heart, and they are the secular, the satanic, and the spirit. Now, the spirit is very easy to spot once you know the voice of God. The spirit aligns itself with God's word and with God's nature. Now, the satanic is very easy for any believer who's been serving the Lord for any number of years, any believer who's had any experience in the presence of God or with the Holy Spirit or even slightly knows the voice of God or is in the Word, that believer will be able to spot the satanic like that. It comes across very easily. You know what I'm talking about? Like you listen to a certain song, comes on the radio, your, your, a certain movie comes across the television, a certain person comes in, or there's just this, this demonic feel to it, you can tell. And it's actually quite easy to spot the satanic because the satanic will always be in direct contradiction to the word. The satanic contradicts the word. Now, the satanic is when the enemy speaks to you to not forgive, when the enemy tells you things about yourself that are contrary to what the word of God tells you about yourself. It's very easy to spot the satanic so long as you are serving the Lord and you're in the, the prayer room, you're in the word, you're asking God to clarify things. It's very easy to spot the satanic. Now the secular is a little more difficult because the secular isn't necessarily anti-Christ. It is just the lack of God. It is I like to call the secular the lawyer of sin. In other words, the secular looks for loopholes around God's law of righteousness and love. The secular looks for very subtle ways to violate the conscience. I mean, I'm talking about, um, you know, certain things like some Christians believe it's okay to drink. That's secular. Some Christians believe it's okay to go to these, you know, these nightclubs or whatever they want to call. That's secular. There's some people who ask the question, well, how close can I get to, to sin without actually sinning? That is the voice of the secular. The satanic will straight out say something that is wrong. The secular will speak with more subtlety and tell you the things that are near the line. But the spirit asks you and the spirit pleads with you to flee away from that line, to flee away from even the appearance of ungodliness. The spirit pulls you from the darkness and doesn't even want you anywhere near the darkness. So the satanic, the secular, and the spirit. Now, the spirit is different than the other voices. The secular will always contradict the nature of God. This is why it's so difficult to spot because it's easy to quote the Bible. It's easy to read the Bible and know directly how the satanic voice is contradicting that. You know, the scripture says that the children of Israel knew God's acts, but Moses knew God's ways. There's a deeper understanding of God that comes. And this is why as someone becomes more spiritual, they become less secular. The secular says, how much can I look like the world and still be of God? So the satanic is an obvious giveaway because it's direct contradiction to the word of God. The secular is very subtle. And this is why mature believers have issues with things that immature believers do not. Whereas a mature believer might say, well, I'm not going to participate in that. The immature believer will say, well, I'm, I am free in Christ to do so. Paul the Apostle addressed such things and he says, well, you know, actually, everything is permissible, but not all things are beneficial. So, satanic, obvious, secular, subtle, spirit is also obvious if you're in the Word and in the prayer. If you're in the prayer room, you'll know the voice of the Spirit. So, the satanic contradicts the Word, the secular contradicts the nature of God, and the Spirit aligns with both the Word and the nature of God. So those are the only three voices. Everything you will ever hear from people, from circumstances, and the list goes on, will categorically fall into one of those, circumstance, or one of those categories. So John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said something very profound. He says, My sheep hear my voice. Now, I know that might be oversimplifying it, but I've come to find that the greatest truth I can tell you concerning the voice of God, people come to me all the time, Brother David, how do I hear God? How do I hear God? How do I hear God? This is the most profound thing I might be able to tell you concerning the word, concerning the voice, is that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. You see, everyone who belongs to God, everyone who is a sheep, hears him. The question is not, How do I hear the voice of God or can I hear the voice of God? The question you need to be asking yourself is, am I his sheep? Do I belong to him? If you belong to him, you are hearing his voice. So this is the most radical thought right here. If you're a believer filled with the Holy Spirit, 
You already hear God. The question is not of hearing God, but of recognizing His voice when He speaks. So, this is interesting because in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, 1 Samuel 3, verse 1 through 10, we read the story of how God called Samuel. Now, now this is interesting. 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called again, called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. This is a perfect example of someone who was hearing God, but didn't know he was hearing God. So it's not a matter of hearing God. You already hear Him. The volume is already up. It's already there. The key is recognizing God's voice among all others. Recognizing the spirit among the satanic and the secular. So I want to give you three keys now to how you can more clearly hear or recognize the voice of God. And the first key is something I've taught about often, so I won't spend too much of my time on this one. But the first key, very simple, is silence and stillness. Now, silence is practical. Silence is a matter of discipline. Silence is a matter of action. Silence is the putting away of outer distraction. You shut off the TV, turn off the radio, tell people you're not available, go to the private prayer room. Silence is practical. And the scripture says in Psalm 62, 1, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. Now this is talking about a deeper form of silence because he says my soul waits in silence. Not my physical body, my soul waits in silence. So silence is the putting away of outer distraction but stillness is the quieting of the soul. It's quieting anger. It's quieting confusion. It's quieting the chaos and the troubles and cares of this world. It's putting outside of your recollection, it's putting outside of your mind, out of your awareness, the things that disturb you about your life right now. When you go to pray, you'll notice the enemy starts fighting you with accusation, temptation, deception. He starts throwing these different assaults at you to try to distract the mind from hearing God. You know that thoughts are the actions of the mind? And so the enemy tries to get you to turn your mind to something else so that the soul has, has to work, has to hear, has to listen, to hear through all of the noise. Can you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit amidst the noise of life. And silence and stillness is very key. The scripture says this in Psalms chapter 46, verse number 10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The scripture says, Be still and know. Stillness precedes revelation. Before you can know, you have to be still. He says, be still and know that I am God. Not be still and know your troubles. Be still and know your faults. Be still and know what worries you. He says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and put your mind on me. Be still and focus on me. Be still and let the eyes of your heart look at the face of Jesus. Be still and know that I am God. Not be still and know things about yourself. Not be still and know things about this world. Be still and know, have revelation of who I am. When you focus on the Lord, when you look to Jesus, causes stillness and worship results. You know, worship can be as quiet as a whisper. 
yet it can drown out all of the noise of the cares of this world. Worship can be as quiet as a tear streaming down your face, but it can silence the voice of every demon in hell. Silence and stillness are the keys to moving right into the presence. I'm often, I often visit churches, and this is not to sound critical, this is not to be mean, but the truth is that not everyone understands this. And what people lack in power, what they lack in the presence of God, they try to make up for with hype and emotion and music. And you can tell when there's a real tangible manifestation of God's presence. In fact, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11 to 13 says this. This is the scripture now. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? A whirlwind appeared, an earthquake appeared, a fire appeared, and God appeared in the still, the still small voice. I was listening to my brother Michael, who actually taught Spirit Church last week. I was listening to a sermon. He was talking about this very verse. And he said something so profound, and I, I, it really caught my attention. He said, you know, God in the earthquake shook the prophet, and he had no choice but to be shaken. The whirlwind, had it come by him close enough, he would have had no choice. He would have been taken up. The fire, had it got close enough, he would have had no choice. He would have been burned. But God appeared in the still, small voice because it presented to the prophet a choice to obey. And you know, we often look for God to speak in these very obvious ways. And the reason we have to settle for the fire, the reason we have to settle for the whirlwind, the reason we have to settle for the earthquake is because we're not willing to discipline ourselves to find the silence and the stillness that leads to the revelation of who God is. This is something I've been thinking about. I realize that God had to show Thomas. Remember Jesus, he said, go ahead, touch the holes in my hand. And Thomas touched and he believed. And Jesus said, you believe because you've seen, but blessed are those who have not seen, yet still believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. There is something that happens in our relationship with God when he's able to do less for us and still we do more. When you come to the place where you don't have to settle, I mean, we lay out these fleeces for God. God, if this is really you, do this. God, if this is really you, do that. When deep in your spirit, you know what he's speaking, you know what he said, but you're looking for something obvious, not because you really don't know if it's God or not, but because you want to delay. But let me tell you something, delay is disobedience. Timing is just as important to the will of God as any act of obedience you'll carry out. Delay is disobedience. This is why we have to be sensitive. You know, when I think of sensitivity, I think of, you ever heard of, you ever heard of a sensitive tooth? For where the moment you touch it, you react with pain? Or if you have a, a, something wrong with your arm or, or your body and it's sensitive or maybe a burn on your skin and you touch that skin, you're going to react instantly because that's what sensitivity is. Or you ever offend someone who's overly sensitive? You say one thing and they just start crying. It's because they react because they're overly sensitive. Sensitivity is not just the ability to sense something. Sensitivity speaks of how quickly something reacts to something else. Being sensitive to the voice of God has everything to do with how quickly you respond to what you hear. I want to hear the voice of God with such clarity that I could hear a whisper in the Spirit. I want to hear the voice of God with such clarity that when God speaks, I'm not wavering back and forth. And I know you want the same, and here's how you do it. You move into silence and stillness. God cannot speak, or you cannot hear Him, I should rather say. 
You cannot hear Him when you're standing in the midst of the clutter and the chaos of this life. You've got to remove yourself from the chaos. Remove yourself from the clutter. And that is found in prayer in the places of silence and stillness before God. Our generation has so much trouble. We are constantly distracted with technology and entertainment. And because everything is fast-paced, quick, and, and so loud and boisterous and, and clamorous, really, we become dulled. Our senses become dulled. And if something doesn't entertain us, if something's not fast-paced, then we'll lose interest within a few seconds. People miss out on the wealth of knowledge that rests in books. I mean, I think about how many books I've read that have transformed my life. I look at my brain kind of like a computer, and books are kind of like software that you put on that computer. You can learn to do almost anything. And if you read a book, you're programming your brain. You're loading that software, that, that computer software, onto your computer that is the brain. That's why it's so important to be careful what you read. Yet some people are so lazy that they can't even read past a chapter with something that is going to change their life. And this is what God wants you to get to the place to where you are able to silence the inner chaos and just listen. Don't just get in there and start being boisterous with your request. Be still and know. So number one, the first key to recognizing the voice. Remember, he's, always, he's speaking to you now. That's the truth. He's speaking to you now. He's saying something to you now. Because God, God's word is eternal. Every word that is ever spoken hangs in eternity for all to claim it from whatever era they may be from. When God speaks, it's eternal. So when God speaks to you, is God speaking to you right now about your future? He's speaking to you right now about your destiny, your call, what you're supposed to do. He's talking to you right now. Can you hear him? Silence and stillness, number one. Number two, very practical. John chapter 14, verse number 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, all that he has said to us is recorded in the Word. Number two, the way you begin to recognize the voice of God is through the Word. Now, I don't have to check the caller ID for most people who call me. The moment I push, I answer on my car, and push the one because I, I don't like to be a distracted driver, you know, like some individuals. I like to focus on the road. And so when I, when I answer a call, I do it from my steering wheel and I, I say hello. And then the moment the voice comes through, if it's somebody I know, I don't have to ask who this is. I just say, oh, hey, so and so, how are you? Because I've heard their voice so often that they could speak one word and I'll recognize it. You know, your family members, your friends, you hear them speak one or two words, you will recognize it the moment they speak it. Why? Because you've heard it so many times before. God's voice is no different. The way you hear His word with clarity is by reading the Bible. You know how I know when God speaks to me? Because it sounds so much like what's in His word. And I recognize His voice because I hear it every day through the Word. And I can't describe my, my loved one's voices to you. If you ask me to describe, you know, someone's voice, or my dad's voice, or my sister's voice, or my wife's voice, I could give you some traits. Like, oh, it's a female voice, it's a male voice, it's a little bit on the deep end, a little on the high end. But I couldn't, I mean, it'd be very difficult. It, there, there are a lot of nuances to a voice that make it very difficult to describe. The same is true with the voice of God. I ask you, how do you describe the voice of God? You say, I don't know, I just know it when I hear it. And the more you hear it, the more familiar it becomes. So you hear it more often by getting into the Word. If you can get this truth within you, if you get the Word of God in you, you'll be able to hear His voice, recognize it with such clarity there will be hardly be a doubt when He speaks to you. If you will get into the Word, the Word will get inside of you. If you will commit to the Word, the Word will commit to you. It's a person. The Word of God, when read by the Holy Spirit's revelation, when the Holy Spirit accompanies you in the reading of the Word, the Bible ceases to become a biography and instead becomes a living person. Jesus said, He will remind you of the things I have said, that's the Word, and He, the Holy Spirit, will reveal through the Word truth. You want to recognize the voice of God then get in the Word more often. 
How can you expect to recognize the voice if you haven't been hearing it? If you haven't been coming to know it through the word? You know, and then some voices, sometimes I'll get a, a phone call and I'll click, hello, you know, how, how are you? And I'll hear a voice. I'll go, I know that voice, but I don't quite know who that is. I'll say, who is this? I'll say, oh, this is so-and-so. Oh, my goodness, so-and-so. I haven't heard you in so long. And because it's been so long since I've heard their voice, I have trouble recognizing it. Some of you, it's been so long since you've been in the Word that you have trouble recognizing the voice of God. It's time to familiarize yourself with His voice again through His Word and with the aid of His precious Holy Spirit.